get ready. We're going to have some fun today. We're going to learn a lot. We're going to think differently, and we're going to get a lot done with you. Here's how it's going to work. We're going to have five sessions, breakout sessions during lunch, a networking break in the afternoon, and close with a keynote, followed by a private reception. Just a reminder, if you have any questions during the day, please use your chat box to communicate with us up here and get in touch. Each session will have three speakers that will each speak for approximately 20 minutes. Then we'll proceed to a group Q&A with the audience. Please remember to submit your questions in the Zoom chat box. And for those of you that are on Twitter, please use the hashtag PARS2020 or tweet at us at PARS2020. Our first session. Established in the mid-1970s, defunded by Congress and done away with by the mid-1990s, the Office of Technology Assessment, now a historical artifact, once stood as a well-organized apparatus designed to provide a structured, systematic approach to understanding the policy implications of introducing new health technologies. The absence of the OTA program in the U.S. since the 1990s has contributed to the creation of entry barriers to access and reimbursement of many promising health technologies, including PGX. However, elsewhere around the world, things have been very different. In the early 2000s, a well-organized group of diverse professionals came together to champion health technology assessments in a new way. The result was UNETA, which led to a framework called the HTA Core Model. Our first speaker has been trailblazing new ways of thinking in HTA for nearly 30 years. Finn Christensen is an international strategic consultant in HTA and HEOR implementation and management, and is a professor in health services research in HTA at the University of Southern Denmark since 1999. He is also external lecturer at the Copenhagen Business School. He has headed the coordinating secretariat of the European Network for HTA, UNETA, from its inception in 2006, and was chairman of the UNETA Executive Committee until 2016. He publishes frequently in scientific journals and was editor of a health technology assessment handbook. He is now a consultant to the public and private organization and companies worldwide. Over to Finn. Thank you very much for this introduction. Um, I uh, join you remotely from uh, Copenhagen area in Denmark, Europe. I'd really have loved to be in the building of National Academy of Sciences, but that must be another time. So I'm going to uh, address uh, the issue of health technology assessment and some of the trends that we are seeing, and I'll try to discuss this into uh, the situation of pharmacogenomics and digital health. Next slide. So we can see that there is a surge in the use of HTA by decision makers. And so there are more and more entities that are doing HTA uh, to inform uh, payers and decision makers at different levels of healthcare. Um, I think it's important up front here now to mention that we should see HTA as a process, not as the decision. And I'll come back into that. It's informing decisions, but it's not a decision in itself. What we realize is increasingly, and we saw that already when we started UNETA, that there are a lot of companies, innovators, that are gain, engaging with many different payers and their HTA bodies to find out how they can, uh, uh, and, and to inform the HTA uh, processes. And we need to still work on how we can get smarter and more efficient in this process. It's really time and and money consuming. And then I'll, by the end, uh, at relatively high level, address some of the challenges in precision medicine and digital health. And I'll also explain why I bring them together. Next one. This is a recent uh, definition of HTA that, that's been updated with the involvement of many different organizations. Uh, it can be found, uh, for example, on the website of INATA, which is the international network for HTA institutions worldwide. And uh, I participated, uh, I was asked to participate for ISPO in this work. So ISPO also eventually, like the other institutions, endorsed the definition. I've extracted some of the things from the de definition. First of all, we should 
recognize that to do the HTA is not sort of a narrative process. It's a systematic work. It's involving many uh, disciplines. Um, yes, and it is a process. It should be transparent. It should use explicit state-of-the-art methods to uh, assess evidence. And it's with this purpose of try to determine the value of health technologies. I already mentioned that it's about informing in order to actually promote, as was also said uh, in the beginning by Ben, uh, an efficient, high quality, equitable uh, system, health system that is actually able to provide technologies to the patients. Then it also mentions that value to some extent is in the uh, eye of the of the viewer or whatever it's said in English. And uh, that means that there is also a leap between the assessment and uh, deciding the overall value, which we'll also address in a moment. Next. Just following up on the distribution in the world of, of HTA institutions, these are the members of INATA and um, there are many more institutions, but we can see that there is actually a highest density in Europe, but there are also uh, institutions, one in North America, one in South America, in um, Asia Pacific, Latin America. In uh, North America, there are more institutions in Canada participating in the INATA than in, in the USA. There's actually one, since a long time member of INATA from USA and it's ARC, Agency for Health Research and Quality, a federal agency. We also know that, for example, in US, an institution, an entity like ICER is doing very much what would be considered to be HTA. Um, it's not a member. I don't know if it ever was considered uh, or considering. But it also is a requirement to be member of INATA that you actually have some kind of formal role to play in informing the decision makers. And this may in fact not be the case of ISO, although I can say from knowing many people in the P&T committee area uh, in USA that a lot of attention is paid to the outputs of ISO. Next. This is a screen dump of um, a publication from last year from Value in Health, where we reported from a work uh, over a couple of years by uh, a multidisciplinary international group uh, organized by ESPOL. The aim was to identify um, the need for good practices in health technology assessment. So basically, most of the work was to go through systematically what's available in terms of guidance and good practices in the different um, disciplines that contribute to HTA. So if you look across this list of participants, you can also see that um, they are indeed from a number of different contributing sciences, including, of course, health economics um, and uh, epidemiology, etc. Next. This is a, a key uh, illustration that is reflecting uh, quite uh, some, um, well, result of, of um, discussions we had where we really wanted to follow up on what originally has been defined actually when OTA was working in the US and had a HTA in the 70s that there is a decision process and then there is an HTA process that is informing. And so I highlighted here that the healthcare technology decision problem is basically sitting with the decision maker. And in order to reach a decision, there's something called policy analysis going on. Um, and um, HTA actually feeds into this stage of policy analysis. So in parallel from problem to decision, there is an HTA process. And I'll just highlight a couple of things from that project while going to the next slide. So next slide. So we talk about framing and scoping. Scoping is the process of translating the decision problem into something that can be addressed 
with um, scientific methods and, and in a structured way? What are the key questions to answer? So this uh, step uh, is actually quite important for making sure that the work of the HTA is really relevant for the decision maker. So the decision maker may actually have in front uh, the question of which patient group might be offered this gene technology? Are there specific subgroups that are more relevant than, than others? What is the, the consequences of using it? What is the evidence? Um, what is the organizational setup that needs to be in place uh, in order to provide this uh, uh, gene te technology? So clearly something beyond just thinking about like a drug, uh, uh, a, a chemical or a biological drug. Next. The most, uh, the, the largest part of the process is the assessment. And there's a lot of guidance in this area, particularly uh, in the area of identification and assessment of uh, clinical uh, evidence, standards for using epidemiological data, etc. There are also standards for how to do peer review of results, etc. There are also existing good guidance on how to do budget impact modeling and modeling. Next. When it comes to contextualization, let me just say that what, by moving one slide back, what we can see is that we don't have a lot about uh, personalized medicine, uh, cell and, and gene therapies. And um, it's not that we completely ignored it, but the fact is that uh, there's really not at this time an international existing consensus about what would be good practices in this area. It's an urgent need that we move towards having those kinds of standards in the coming years. Next. Then here's another one which is actually important, and that is that with all this structured, scientifically produced information and, uh, and evidence, you need to put it into context in order to make it uh, ed uh, um, edible uh, to, the, to the next phase, which is the policy analysis and the decision. That's what we call contextualization. It's also called appraisal. Appraisal is very distinct in how the uh, UK institution NICE is working, but for most languages, appraisal and assessment is actually nearly the same word. So we wanted to make sure that we are putting emphasis on con putting into context. So in that process, we talk about applying deliberative processes, uh, doing committee work, and um, in, in involving stakeholders. But what we can say is that there are actually not so many good practices descriptions in this area. So there's a lot of processes that are not sufficient uh, transparent and not sufficient described on actually how they are done. They may sit inside of the decision maker and what the only thing you see is the decision and now not how they actually uh, got to that decision. So that's a, an important thing that we pointed to, would need more focus, appraisal and um, deliberative processes. Next. I'll now turn to the HTACOM model, which was uh, introduced by Ben earlier. This is coming out of a network that started in 2006 and is still ongoing in Europe. It's supported by the EU um, and it's a health program and it's a co-founded by uh, the member states and all member states except Luxembourg uh, are participating uh, in this uh, network. And there are also some other countries outside of EU participating from the European area. Um, and um, I want to say something about the model that has uh, been developed uh, by UNETA to help structure the information and hopefully or with the intent also to reduce duplication. Next slide. So the aim that was set out in 2005 when we started was to be better in uh, capturing the shareable core of HTA uh, and, and to enable production of structured information that can actually be shared in a way that is helpful in the process of producing uh, individual HTA uh, 
uh, pro, uh, reports. Um, next. And so there are three components you need to have in place when you want to have such a, uh, a system like the HTA core model. You need to have an overview of the kind of questions that you would tend to ask and have and ask for answers to. That's called the ontology. It actually is, is out there in more than 100 uh, standard questions, you could say. Um, that not, not, of course, not all of them should be addressed every time. Then there is some methodological guidance, but a lot of guidance is actually going elsewhere where you have good existing guidance that can just be pointed to. And then there is this interesting thing about making a reporting structure where you would be able to present and keep the um, the answers to um, to the, the different uh, questions inside of the model. Next slide. The overall structure is uh, first level nine domains. As you see here, the, the problem, defining the problem, the technical characteristics of the technology, safety, clinical effectiveness, efficacy, effectiveness, cost and economic evaluation, ethical analysis, organizational aspects, patient and social aspects, and legal aspects. Now, all of these aspects are not relevant for any uh, technology. So a lot of focus is actually around the first four or maybe five. But for example, in the case of, uh, of um, targeted uh, medicine, um, ethics and uh, legal aspects may play a role. Uh, there are, uh, are examples that uh, legal aspects are important when you want to implement, say, um, cell therapy in uh, an institution in a country. Organizational aspects are uh, playing a bigger role because the whole attention to how is this technology going to play into existing pathways, etc., is coming up more as more relevant. Um, and um, patient and social aspects, again, is uh, increasingly asked for. So the model enables this, but the core of the work is these four first domains. And that's also where UNETA is producing today in uh, so-called relative effectiveness assessments that are done with the intent that they can be used in uh, several countries, sev by several institutions, but produced jointly. And this is uh, an ongoing activity that is uh, still being refined. Next. So the idea with having a structure for, um, uh, you could say a structured repository uh, for uh, for the, the HTA is that the questions and answers called uh, elements or cards could actually be put in a repository so that you would put it there when you were producing your HTA, but it would be sitting there and other partners might would be able to take it out if they were to make their own HTA on more or less the same topic or maybe revisiting when there is a new competitor uh, technology on, um, um, knocking at the door. This has shown to be a very big challenge to do so that it's digitally uh, um, handy and uh, more or less real time. So basically there is a need to revisit the HTA core model uh, with, uh, with new eyes. And here it's important to underline that although there is this R, like it's a registered trademark, it is for anyone to use. There is a process of um, register, uh, of licensing, but it's basically, and it's for free, but it's basically that uh, the network wants to see uh, how it's used. And this licensing is taken care of by an institution in Finland. So by way of uh, your NETA website, you will be able to find your way into a lot of information about this model. Uh, as it has been developed and uh, piloted and tested and brought into use. Next. So I mentioned some challenges in precision medicine and digital health. And um, uh, I think that some of them have already been addressed. Um, I find that it's really important to have an international develop of 
development of uh, methodology that can uh, be guiding HTA and outcomes research in the coming uh, years in this area. There's definitely a need for broad involvement of stakeholders. This would increase the relevance of such guidance enormously. We know that the decisions of uptake uh, of these technologies is often associated with a high degree of uncertainty and high cost. And this is something that needs to be addressed uh, by stakeholders together in, in a constructive uh, discussion. Um, next. This one is um, a slide that is part of a, a reporting from a European project called IMI Adapt Smart. It's, it was simply established as a project in order to um, de develop uh, models for how there could be more adaptive pathways for, uh, for technologies, particularly the technologies we are talking about today. And so the white um, uh, circles are indicating where there should be a broad stakeholder involvement and the individual stakeholders are uh, designated with uh, symbols. But we know, we see immediately discovery and preclinical to be well-known steps. Um, but then it goes into a cogwheel that is saying preliminary evidence. And in fact, the idea is that coming with preliminary evidence, basically with relatively little clinical evidence at that time, there is a review and a kind of authorization by a regulatory body that will then allow the process to go on so that it may uh, go into market access. And then by way of that, by going into uptake, it's actually possible to build more and more uh, information and evidence that can then make you revisit your initial um, authorization and revisit any payer decision. So this was uh, was done with uh, involvement of uh, uh, all relevant stakeholders, including uh, clinicians and patients and payers, HTAs. But unfortunately, at this time, payers and HTAs are relatively reluctant to go into these kinds of discussions, although they basically should really be actively involved in informing the initial stages of evidence generation because they eventually will be uh, the decision makers next. Another thing just by the end I'll mention is that uh, last year uh, I was chair of a, a round table, a series of seven round tables in um, important European countries and regions for something called e EIT Health. We were not addressing drugs in fact, we were addressing um, medical technologies and um, we focused when we got started actually on digital technologies. This is also reported and, and accessible through these links. Next. And, and there are main concepts in optimizing that uh, were brought forward. That this is a process with multiple actors. There are multiple parallel pathways. For example, the pathway that leads to the regulatory uh, approval and the pathway that is leading into clinical decision making and uh, payer decision making. And that uh, the whole process uh, is uh, depending on a kind of ecosystem driver. What we saw was the frustration of small startup companies that really had no overview of what was in he ahead of them and therefore were spending uh, maybe unnecessary resources. Uh, next. So instead of having the traditional model of uh, innovation pathway from uh, ideation to, to take up, uh, we talked about uh, a, um, a structure with four layers of a pathway. And um, it's um, the head, one headline is learn and define. And inside of that is actually that there should be much more interaction with innovators about stating unmet needs in the system and by, uh, by clinicians. 
So um, that could be a driver at initial stages to actually prioritize where to put your efforts and also your in investments. I think uh, I um, use, have used my time and um, I, I, I would be more than happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Fen.